behave yourself, camera. I want no, no problems for you today. All right. So where were I? Uh, let's see. We last time we've been talking about all this cool stuff with developmental genetics, and we've been talking about animal development and how you set up patterns. So how one cell in an organism can have a different pattern of expression than another cell in the organism, which is kind of crucial to making us what we are. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up that a little bit. I want to talk a bit about nematodes, because nematodes are a classic, classic system in studying uh, the genetics of embryonic development. And then I want to say a few words about plants. I was realizing I haven't talked much about plants in this class. We started off with pea plants and Mendel, and then we just kind of abandoned botany. So. I wish we'd go back to the first week. That was so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's just let's just forget just, everything we we'll learned. Learn this and then way back now. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah. We just we just wipe all this. Well, unfortunately, though, as we get deeper into plant genetics, it'll also get more complicated. <laughs> Nothing is simple. You're a biologist. you got to get used to that. All right. This yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll say a little bit about plants. I, it's going to be too little about plants, uh, because there's a lot of really interesting things going on. That's are radically different from how animals work. And uh, we'll just have to give you a brief overview Yes, we can do this. What would help? I turned it on. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so where we left off last time is I had introduced you to this idea that when we look at animals, this is true for basically all animals, there's a few general rules that we can see that are consistent across all these different animal groups. And uh, one is that we've got these Hox genes, these homeobox containing genes that demonstrate a spatial distribution of expression. So there's something fundamental going on there, and we don't know all about it. There's something going on with the regulation of Hox genes that allows them to be expressed in a spatial pattern along the length of the animal, and that can be a trigger for the development of different regions of the organism. There are others that are also important, like I mentioned, okay, we got NKX 2.5, also known as Tin Man and Drosophila. Uh, this is the gene that specifies where you make the heart. So it gets turned on in a specific region. And then there's PAC6, which makes the eye spot. And again, these are kind of universal. So yeah, the flies you are looking at in the lab use PAC6 to specify where they make an eye. And you can do all kinds of fun experiments like mis-expressing PAC6 on the legs of the fly and then the fly makes eyes on its legs, as you might expect. Um, but this gene is also shared with us. So we use PAC6 to specify where to put our eyes here and here. Okay, so we got these general rules that are defining all this stuff. Uh, one of the things that's also going on is that we have to specify interactions between tissues and cells in order to generate these differences. So this is a this is a another universal principle. Is we got to have a way for cells to talk to one another. So cell signaling. Yeah, go take Stephen DeLaurier's course. It's all about cell signaling. So how do cells talk to one another? How do they specify each other's identity? And we need these kinds of interactions to set up more complex patterns. So one a classic example, as I said, nematodes. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff that has been learned in nematodes. And why is that? It's because nematodes are disgustingly simple almost nothing to them. Uh, they're tiny little worms, 
microscopic worms. They've got a limited number of cells. And most interestingly, they have a predetermined pattern of cell development. What does that mean? That means you can look at a developing nematode. You go from one cell to two cell to four cell, etc. And each of those cells has a fate. And we can figure out what it is. We can predict, oh, this cell is going to go on and divide and make mesoderm. And as it divides, it makes little bits and pieces of mesoderm. We say, oh, well, this, this cell is going to make this part of mesoderm. And this cell is going to make this other part of mesoderm. And we can work it all out that way. If you read the nematode literature, for instance, you will find lots of examples of pedigrees. Yeah, we've, we've talked about pedigrees earlier in this course. These are a different kind of pedigree, though, because they're illustrating the fates of individual cells in a single organism. And you can work out how all those things interact. And this is, this is one of the better known examples of this. Uh, this, this is warm, warm corn, I guess, because this is, this is a nematode vulva. So what we're seeing here is this, we're zoomed in really tight on it. Uh, so this is a close-up shot of the vulva of nematode worm. The rest of the worm is extending way off here and here and so forth. Um, the vulva in a worm is really, really simple. It's a stack of cells. So you see these are cells all piled up here. So they stack up, and in between them, there's a little space that makes a pore. So this is where um, semen can enter and where eggs can exit. So we got this really simple structure. That, again, that's one of the appeals of nematodes, is that when you get into it, it's superficially extremely simple, just a few cells you gotta worry about. Of course, the gene regulation is much more complicated. And uh, this, is, this is a normal nematode. So you can sort of see what it's supposed to look like. Just a stack of cells here. And uh, these are mutants. So this is another virtue of the nematode, is it's easy to make lots and lots of mutants. And what you do is you typically make a mutant by just you just zap it, and you look at it develop, and you ask if there are any deviations from the normal pattern of the cleavages and pedigrees of the cells involved. Okay, so there's there's our nematode. Well, let me just step back. So there's there's the worm. It's not very exciting, is it? There's not much to it. But that's the appeal. Now what you see here is, now this is a differential interference contrast microscopy image of the side of the worm. So we are again looking at a vulva right here. That's what this structure is here. You can see the kind of pedigree that's drawn here. And what, what we can do is we can watch these cells at an earlier stage of development, and they've all got names. So this is P5P, P6P, P7P. P5P is going to divide. That's what this is. And it's going to make a couple more divisions over here. This is going to con contribute to the skin layer. It's got a syncytial layer of skin right over here. And this cell uh, is going to carry on a specific set of divisions. Uh, this is a transverse division, a longitudinal division, etc. And set up the, the pattern here. Another important player is this one right here, the anchor cell. So we've got a cell here, the anchor cell. We've got a vulva forming. We got on this side, we got various things like muscles. You know, you don't want your you don't want your pore to just kind of flop open. You got muscles around it to close it off. And then we got just boring little skin over here. The pattern of divisions are illustrated here, where there's P5P, P6P, P7P that I mentioned before. Uh, there's the anchor cell sitting here. 
And what will happen is it will go, these cells will go through a series of characteristic cleavages. They'll divide in very specific ways. So P3P, P4P, and P8P are going to be boring. They're going to, they're not actually going to kind of, they're actually not going to divide so much as they're kind of going to fuse with their neighbors and make this smooth sheath, this sheath that surrounds the animal. Uh, P5P, P6P, and P7P are going to go through characteristic divisions. P6P will go through these, these kinds of divisions and produce that stack of cells to make the boa. So there's, there's the opening right there. It's just a stack of cells sitting next to it. P5P and P7P are going to make supporting cells. They're going to follow a secondary feed. And they're going to support the vulva, making those muscles and things like that. So we've got a primary fate, a secondary fate, and a tertiary fate. How do the cells know to do this? That's the big question. What is the rule they use to figure this out? Well, what they've done is they can go in, they can make all these mutations. This is what makes them great for genetics. Also, they've got a faster generation time than flies. Seriously, if we, did, if we did nematodes here, we could do dozens of experiments over the course of the semester, uh, but you'd have to learn how to deal with worms, which are pretty tiny. Uh, what this is, is they found early on uh, this cute little mutation. This is called vul or vulvalus. Mutations in which the vulva does not form at all. You just got a sheet of skin there, kind of a Barbie doll phenotype for these animals. Uh, and when you look at the cleavages that form them, you see that P5P, P6P, and P7P, they don't do the characteristic divisions. They instead just look, they look exactly like P4P and P8P and all those others. They just form the, the syncytial, uh, syncytial skin surface. And these are really easy to see because when you, when you look at the worms, you see first of all this. This is called the bag of embryos phenotype. There's a worm, it's full of eggs, full of embryos. The worm is, um, it's a hermaphrodite. It can self-fertilize without a vulva. So this is a terrible fate. So the poor worm is born, it starts making eggs, and it cannot fertilize them with a partner, but it can fertilize them itself. So it's there to happily make lots of eggs and produce lots of embryos, uh, but there's no vulva, so it can't lay the eggs. So they just pile up on the, in the interior. And uh, eventually those eggs, they go ahead and develop into worms. That says right here. This is called the bag of worms phenotype. Our poor mama worm is just full of baby worms. And then she ruptures and dies and the baby worms escape. Yeah, this is, this is a terrible thing to imagine. Anyway, okay. So we got, we got mutations then that transform uh, P6P into skin stuff. And they don't go on and develop properly. We can also find mutations like this one. This is multivulva. You can guess what that does. There's a wild type right there. There's the nice vulva right there. And here's multivulva, which has all these additional openings all over the place. So it's just full of uh, vulval openings for the eggs to come out with. And again, uh, when we look at this, what we see is, okay, there's a P7P, there's P5P. They think they're supposed to make the vulva. They are supposed to make supporting cells, remember. But in, this, in the case of this mutation, no, those cells are all confused. They think, oh, well, I'm supposed to make a vulva too. So clearly there are some, there's some kinds of interactions going on where something has to be telling one of those P cells to make a vulva, 
It also has to be telling the adjacent B cells, oh, you're supposed to make supporting cells. And in addition, there's got to be information that says to the remaining cells, no, make skin. So we got three fates that have to be decided. And what does it? Well, the idea is it's that anchor cell. Remember that little, that big fat cell that was sitting up above the vulva? So among the things we can do, we can just go in and zap it. Destroy the anchor cell. This is a fun experiment. You get a microscope and you fit it out with a laser. And uh, you can sit there and look through the eyepieces. They go blank when you fire the eyepiece, when you fire the laser, obviously. But you can look through there. And uh, they also have a little joystick. And you can move the crosshairs around and put them on a cell you want. Then you push a button on the joystick. It's like a video game. And you can then kill the anchor cell. So you destroy that. And what will happen? Well, you will get vulvaless worms. Which suggests that maybe what's happened in the vulva, vulvaless phenotype in those mutants is that there's a gene that has been lost that is the signaling gene telling cells to make the vulva. So it's saying there's probably an inductive signal from the anchor cell to the adjacent P cells to tell them to make a vulva. We can also do this. Uh, as long as you got your handy dandy laser and you got your joystick and you can just aim at anything, uh, what if you start killing the P cells? For instance, P6 is supposed to make the vulva, right? What if you kill that cell? but you leave the anchor cell intact. Well, the animal will go ahead and regulate and form a vulva. It will use the P5 or P7 cells instead. This leads to this concept of an equivalence group. So all of the P cells, P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, etc., they are all genetically similar. They've got the same expression patterns. So they're equivalent to each other. But if a signal comes along to one of them to trigger the development of the primary fate to make the vulva, it will do that. But any of the cells are confident to do that. So, we've worked out a whole bunch of these mutations. This is just a fraction of them. So I'll just mention them here. So, uh, for instance, there's a mutation called LIN3. Nematode mutations have the most boring names. Really, they're, they're all named for their effect on the lineage. And so you get LIN3, LIN4, LIN5, and it's hard to keep it straight. But LIN3, this is a gene that produces a secreted epidermal growth factor-like molecule. It's produced by the anchor cell. And if you knock this mutation out, if you, if you ablate that gene or that cell, if you kill that, that particular gene, you don't get the signal to make the vulva. So it leads to the vulvaless phenotype. Makes sense, right? So there's gotta be a signal and the candidate for the signal is LIN3. Now, if you know anything about uh, cell signaling, it's not enough just to have a signal. You also got to have a receptor. There's got to be something that reads that signal. And this is one of those. This is LET23. It's an EGF receptor. Oh, yeah, look here. This is an EGF-like protein. Here's an EGF receptor. And that one is switched on in all of the PN cells. So if you have a loss of function mutations of this, that is, if the cells are no longer receptive to the signal, then you get the vulvaless phenotype. They're being told, make a vulva, but no, oh, they can't hear you. They don't, they don't recognize that signal, so they don't make it. There are also known gain-of-function mutations. That just means that these genes are constitutively active. 
So they are they they carry a mutation that makes them think they're constantly bound to Lin three, and there you get the monophenotype. And then there's another one, Lin fifteen. So this is produced by the skin, the hypodermis. And mutations in this gene lead to the mob phenotype because this is the default signal. This is the signal that says, hey, in the absence of any other information, make the tertiary phenotype. Make skin cells. So you can have uh, mutations here They've lost that information. They don't have that default to go on and make skin. So instead, they make whatever available fate is there, and that's primary or secondary fate. Oh. So I'm going to leave this now. Your textbook has a whole bunch of stuff on nematode genes and nematode genetics. Um, you, should, you should read through that. I'm just giving you a cursory overview of these last concepts in uh, developmental genetics because next week we're going to have to move on to cancer genetics and I'm told I have to give some sample problems in class so I will do that. So i got to wrap this up. This is the last you're going to hear of developmental genetics for me. Okay, so I wanted to lead in here with Another topic that I feel like is not well addressed. Um, I looked at some of my developmental biology textbooks, and oh man, plants are neglected. I feel sad for the plants because there's just not a lot out there. There's lots in the scientific literature, but it's not making its way into the textbooks very much. So, what do we got here? Well, uh, this is a classic example again of a simple phenomenon that's absolutely essential to developmental genetics. And that is, okay, you got a cell. You start off with a cell, a single cell, and it divides into two cells. You have to have a new, new phenotype appear in one of those cells you got to have some kind of differentiation that goes on. Yet often, in many organisms, when you start off, that first cell, it's symmetrical. It's got the same information everywhere. There's nothing to make it different in, in the next division. Uh, so what becomes important here is a concept called symmetry breaking. We need to have something that takes that, that one cell or that two cell stage or even later and tells it this end is up and this end is down. So we got to have some information coming from somewhere. Now in Drosophila, I told you though, though that's one of those maternal effect genes, right? That mama fly packs in an asymmetrical arrangement of molecules into the egg. And that's the symmetry breaking event. That's what gives it a front end and a back end. Lots of organisms don't do that. Humans, for instance, mammals in general, uh, our eggs are symmetrical. They don't have anything to specify a front end or a back end. In mammals, the key event seems to be implantation. So you got this little blob of a cell and it attaches to the uterine lining and that imposes on it an asymmetry. One side of the egg is facing the uterus, the other is facing the lumen of the uterus. And so that's the information it reads to determine which, one, which end goes which way. In plants, gosh, what do you think might do it in plants? You got an egg cell here, and it's going to divide and produce two cells. What kinds of things do you think provide information to a plant cell? Yes, you were going to say something? Like maybe uh, sunlight? Sunlight's a good one, yeah. So this is an, this is an alga, 
And uh, this alga actually uses sunlight to specify which end of the egg is which. Another factor is gravity. You've all done this where, you know, you were in grade school science where you got bean seeds or something and you plant them in a cup and they put out roots and shoots and they go which way, the right way. Yeah, that's light and gravity are read to determine that stuff. So we need something to do the symmetry breaking. In this case, it's light. How does light do it though? So here's an example. We, got, we start off with our unpolarized zygote. It's a nice symmetrical spherical egg. And something, some factor is, and something, some factor is going to impose an orientation on it. And there's lots of things that can do this. Light is one, gravity. Uh, pH is also a factor that can influence this. So that it becomes polarized. And when you look at the cell, what it does, is it's actually got calcium pumps. Calcium is critical for this function. Where what we see here is, okay, we got calcium pumps that are pumping out calcium from the cell. And we also have calcium channels down here that's flowing in. You actually get a net flux of calcium from here up to there and out. And you can put an electrode in here and you can record from it. And you can see a current there's an electrical current that's specifying the orientation of the egg. In some cases, what that seems to do is something like electrophoresis. You've all been doing that in molecular biology, right? You all know about electrophoresis. So you generate a current across the egg, and what that means is that charged molecules in the egg will migrate in specific ways in response to the orientation of that current, and you will get this differentiation into different layers. Now there's something else that's unusual about plants. Um, I'm, I'm an animal biologist. I, I confess it. I mainly, I got a zoology degree. I mainly focus on what's going on in animals. But plants are fascinating because they do everything a little bit differently, sometimes profoundly differently. So in an animal, for instance, as we talked about in Drosophila, you can have gradients of molecules, things think bicoid, for example, and this gradient can be read by cells and specify different uh, tissue types. That's what's going on in the fly. Plants follow a different pattern of regulated growth. So you don't have a plant that's sitting still and listening to signals that are radiating up and down, except physiologically, of course, but in development, no. Instead, what you've got is this system where you've got something called a meristem right here. So plants are in a constant state, near constant state of growth, where they're expanding in a particular direction. And basically, these are all the same tissue types in here. And then at one point, they generate a meristem. And the meristem, for instance, will promote the growth of a leaf. And it will promote the growth of a new stem. And then they'll make a meristem. And it'll promote a leaf. And then a stem growing up here. And so forth. So it's, it's a pattern of regulated growth that generates the shape of the plant. This is what a meristem looks like. So we just look at this diagram down here first. So this is a section through that growing leaf bud. You know, it's, it's supposed to be spring out there. So if you're passing by a tree or something, you take a look, you see all the little bud, buds there? Uh, they're typically at a fork. We got a leaf coming off, you got this little bud right there, and you got the stem coming off. Uh, that's what we're seeing here. So here's a new leaf emerging. This structure here is the meristem. 
and you can see it's got kind of a central, a central dome and then adjacent buds that are coming off. And when you look at it from uh, the apical view up here, you can say, okay, there's the leaf, there's the meristem, here's a lateral bud coming off, the lateral one over here. So there's an interesting pattern of growth where you're starting with a meristem and you're going to have, you're going to bud off a leaf and then the meristem is going to progress and it's going to bud off another leaf which is offset from the first one. So you can actually get kind of a spiral pattern of addition of new features to the stem. So this meristem is kind of a cool structure. The reason we have to do this in a plant is because plants have something called a cell wall. You all remember that from cell biology. Yeah, they got cell walls. Uh, in plants, cells can't exactly do like they do in animals. In animals, cells can just up and separate from their neighbors and go crawling off somewhere else and set up shop there. Not plants. Everything is locked in by the cell walls. So here's our meristem and all the growth is going to be progressing from this point upward. We can do various experiments on meristems. So here, for example, there's, uh, there's our familiar meristem right there. There's the meristem proper right there. There's a leaf bud coming off of there. Uh, we can do things like just lop off the meristem. And what will happen? It will grow a new meristem right there. So they are capable of regeneration at that point. If, on the other hand, you do this, where you just lop off, you do a massive decapitation of this end of the terminal growth zone of the plant, uh, you'll have a stump, and then they'll sprout a new meristem in this space in between. So everything growing in a plant is going to be derived from a meristem. So they're going to tr constantly try to regenerate that. And one of the cute things about this meristem pattern of growth is this, as I said, you got your, you've got your meristem here. And as I said, you get this little leaf primordium coming off of it. And that's going to continue to grow. And then you'll get at some place distant from the original leaf primordium. We'll get another one forming and then another one and then another one. And they'll just kind of rotate around spawning these, these, these leaf meristems and you get patterns like this. So this is the first leaf primordium. Here's a second one that comes along, a third, a fourth, fifth, sixth. You can see how it kind of rotates around to build this structure. And again, you can see this if you look at a fast growing plant. And ask, where are things being added? And you can actually see this pattern. It's a very practical way to grow. Because imagine if you had a plant and it always budded off a leaf on this side, just like that. That would, that would be kind of an awkward looking plant. But this way we get this distribution of leaves all around. Another place where this is important is in flowers. So this is a terminal meristem, the one at the very end of the growing stem. And what we see here is, oh yeah, you might remember this from biodiversity, right? I'm sure you went over this stuff, that when you look at a typical flower, what you find are things like uh, the stigma, uh, the pistil, anthers, you got petals, you got sepals here. Uh, and when you look at the structure, Look at that, it's that kind of circular arrangement again. We're producing these things in this kind of, this circular arrangement of, from the meristem, the way, from the way the meristem works. And when you look at these in some detail, you see a lot of variation in the reproductive structures of flowers. 
So, you know, here we got here we got our petals right here, right? We all know flowers have very different looking petals. Uh, then they also have over here there's the sepals. That's generally that leafy green part that forms a little cup for the flower to be resting in. And then we got the reproductive organs proper in here. So one question is how do they do that? We've got this meristem and we produce these radial arrangements of specific structures. How do they know to make uh, how do they know to make sepals versus petals versus stamens versus carpels? And when we look at, at lots of different flowers, we see similar patterns. As you know, flowers look very different from one another. There's a lot of variation in flowers. But when you get right down into it and ask about the developmental biology of the flowers, you see something very similar in all of them, where there are these meristems that form, and there are these zones that appear in the meristem that are going to distinguish between petals and stamens, for instance. How do they do that? Well, there's a model. This is the standard model of flower differentiation. This is it's also called the ABC model. Why is it called that? Because uh, it has been determined genetically that there are basically three factors that specify the development of those tissues of the flower. So there's one called C. And if you are expressing just C, you make carpels. Okay. Then there's a B factor that you see right here. And the key thing is here, notice B is overlapping with C and A. Where you are expressing both B and C right in here, you're going to make stamens. And over here, we're expressing B and A, you make petals. And if you're expressing just A alone, you make sepals. So there's a lot of very elegant experiments that have been done in this where if, for instance, you knock out the B gene, let's kill the B genes, what do you think the flower would look like? It would just simply be carpels surrounded by sepals, wouldn't it? Not a very attractive flower. What if you just knock out C? Well, then you would have sepals, all right, and you would have petals, but you wouldn't have stamens or carpels. So it'd be, it would be a pretty flower, maybe, but it wouldn't be very productive. It wouldn't be very good at reproducing the plant. But by making these kinds of dissections of gen the genetics of the flowers, you can work out there's just these three things that are important in specifying the fate of the individual tissues. Okay, one last thing I'll mention. So we'll finish up a little early today because we'll just be all done with developmental genetics after this. Um, remember that when I talked about animals, I told you, okay, there's these Hox genes, that we have these homeobox containing genes that are organized in a collinear fashion to specify the identity of tissues along the length of the animal. We do not do things the same way as plants. Plants instead have something called a Mads box. This is distinct from the homeo box. Although in some ways there's some resemblances. This is also a, what was it, 58 to 100 and something uh, nucleotides long to make a short protein sequence. Uh, plants have these Mads boxes where we have homeo boxes. They do the same thing. They are DNA binding proteins. So Mads boxes also bind to DNA in a characteristic way. And they also have other dangling bits of protein hanging off of them that specify their other roles. But they have Mads boxes instead. 
MADS is short for MCM1, Agamus Deficiens SRF, which is about as cryptic as you can get. Uh, they're named after four genes where we identified MADS boxes in different species. Notice there's a human gene here. We also have MADS boxes. They're a generic DNA binding structure. So that isn't too surprising that we would have them. Plants also have homeobox containing genes, but not very many of them. It's a difference in their role. So animals have recruited